You may know the story of the Buddha and the handful of leaves. He was in the forest one day. It was a Singsapa forest. Singsapa is a tree that has little tiny leaves about the size of dimes. And the floor of the forest was covered with leaves. He picked up a handful. And he asked the monks, which is greater, the number of leaves in my hand or the number of leaves in the entire forest? He said, of course, it's the number of leaves in the forest. Then he went on to say the things that he learned in the course of his awakening are like the leaves in the forest. The things he taught were like the leaves in his hand. He chose to teach only the things that would be useful to putting an end to suffering. Other things he left aside. It's important to keep this story in mind when we think about the Buddhist description of the world, the description of rebirth, how karma works in rebirth. Because when you look at his description of the world, it's pretty sketchy. He talks about different levels of being, but he never says that he's going to give you a whole list of all the levels that are out there. And as for rebirth, he, he actually discourages people from wondering, what, am, what was I in a previous lifetime, or what am I going to be in my next lifetime? And at the same time, knowledge of karma and rebirth was an important part of his awakening. This is where you have to make a distinction. The question about what you were in the past is not as, as important as knowing what you did, or the possibility of what you may have done. Because it's your actions that are going to determine what you experience, not the status you had before and the status you're going to have. It's your actions. And why is this important? Because as the Buddha said, skillfulness comes from heedfulness. It doesn't come because you're naturally good or innately good or innately bad. Your innate nature is something that the Buddha said is can change all the time. It's not that set in stone. And what we can do can change all the time, too. The mind can change so quickly, he said, that he couldn't even think of a good analogy for how quickly the mind can change direction. And so he thought the features of the world and the features of karma that are worth knowing. for the sake of developing heedfulness so that you can work on developing more skillful qualities, like we're doing right now, trying to develop a sense of ease and well-being by getting the mind to stay with one object. That's a good practice. And whether it's an easy exercise for you or a hard exercise for you, it's worth doing, worth putting time into, because if the mind doesn't have a sense of well-being, a sense of ease a sense of solidity in the present moment. It can very easily be swayed by its desires for a quick fix or a quick happiness. And those are the desires that cause us to do a lot of unskillful things. And even with karma, the Buddha said, if you try to ask yourself on the fact that I'm suffering this right now or that right now, what karma did I do in the past? He says, don't go there. If you try to figure that out, he says, you can, it can drive you crazy because karma is so complex. The important thing to know is the basic principle, or the basic principles. One is that you do something with a skillful intention, i.e. one free from greed, aversion, and delusion. The result is going to be happy. If you do something with an unskillful intention, the result is going to be miserable. And there are gradations. And because you're doing things all the time, you've got lots of karma. The other thing here, as you realize, is that the fact that you're a human being means that you've got both good and bad karma. And it's also important to realize that not everything you've done shows up right now. There's a mistaken belief that we have one karma account, and what we see right now is the running balance. If the running balance is pretty good, we figure, well, we can just make it better and better, add more money to the account, and we're pretty safe. 
But the Buddha's image of karma is more like a field. In fact, he uses the field a couple of times as his analogy. And karma are the seeds planted in the field. Now, some of the seeds have sprouted already. The plants have grown, they've, they've died. Others are in the course of sprouting. These are the ones you see right now. But there are a lot you that are just sitting there in the dirt waiting for the right time to, to sprout and grow. Which means that you don't know what you've got in your karmic background. Maybe that all the good seeds are showing right now, but the bad seeds may be showing up later. Or vice versa. Some people seem to be having lots of bad seeds right now, but that doesn't mean there aren't good seeds back there. And that's as much as he says you need to know. Here too, the teaching is more of a sketch than a full, full explanation. It's enough of a sketch to make you realize that you've got to work on your skillful qualities. And you can't rest until you've discovered that there is such a thing as a deathless, and you can verify it for yourself. If you haven't reached that point yet in your meditation, anything can happen. So keep that in mind as you're practicing. If you find that you're getting lazy, complacent, remind yourself there is no reason for complacency. Just because you have a good karma showing right now, as I said, doesn't mean that the, the account isn't going to wear out. You have many accounts. many different seeds, growing at different rates, ready to sprout. Sometimes their sprouting is going to depend on what you do right now, which is why it's good to develop a good state of mind right now. And in case there is some bad karma back there, the Buddha said, you work on four qualities so that you don't have to suffer, even from bad karma. The first is that you're, as he says, developed in virtue. And you developed into discernment. In other words, you learn to see your own mind, understand what's going on in your own mind. And you can talk yourself into doing the things that you know are good, but you may not like. And you talk yourself out of doing the things that you may dislike, but you know will be good for yourself. Wisdom for the Buddha is not abstract, it's more strategic. Then he says you're developed in body and mind. That doesn't mean that you go out and you lift weights or you exercise a lot. Developed in body means that you are resistant to pain. Pain comes up and you're not overwhelmed by it. You can sit with it. You can learn to not have it make inroads in the mind. You're developed in mind means you're not the mind doesn't easily get overwhelmed by pleasure. I said, you might think, I have great pleasure, that'd be great. But if you're overwhelmed by pleasure, you get careless again, and you get sloppy, and you get inattentive to what's going on. And the way you develop this ability to not be overcome by pain or pleasure, that's a part of the meditation. With the pain, you learn how to sit with parts of the body that are painful, and you don't have to react. You learn a whole series of skills around pain. You learn how to focus on another part of the body. You learn how to get the breath in that part of the body comfortable. Then you can think of that good breath energy from the comfortable parts going through the pain. Don't let them be stopped by the pain. Think that good breath can go through anything, can penetrate any part of the body. And that can often take a lot of the sting out of the pain. Then you start looking at your perceptions of the pain. Do you think the pain is this one solid mass that's getting in the way of the body. Remember that pain is more like little spots or little dots of pain, arising and falling away, arising and falling away, sometimes very quickly. But it's not solid. If you doubt that, try to look at where is the sharpest point of the pain, and you'll find that it moves. You trace it around, it seems to be running away from you. So you can hold in the perception as as these spots of pain come, think of them not as coming at you, think of them going away. They arise and they disappear, so they're going away, going away, so they're not coming at the mind. You can also ask yourself, have you picked up a 
perception from your childhood that when pain comes it has an intention to hurt you. That might be lurking someplace in your mind. Learn how to take these perceptions apart. And the Buddha's instructions on breath mindfulness, this is called calming mental fabrication. In other words, the perceptions by which you shape your experience. This is one, one of the things you learn in, in meditation, learn in practice of concentration as you develop discernment around concentration. That the perceptions you apply to pains really will make a huge difference to whether you're going to suffer from them or not. As for not being overcome by pleasure, it's important when the mind does begin to gain a sense of well-being from the breath that you don't leave the breath to go for the pleasure, because that undercuts your concentration and the foundation for the pleasure will go away. Either that or you just drift off into a pleasant spot where you're not quite sure if you're awake or asleep. So as you develop your powers of concentration, this is one of the skills you've got to learn. that You can be with pleasure but not be overcome by it. Tell yourself that the pleasure will do its work. You don't have to sit there swallowing it or gobbling it up or wallowing in it. In it. Let the pleasure spread around and it will do the work it needs to do in the body. And finally, the Buddha says you're trying to develop a mind that is unlimited. In other words, your goodwill and your equanimity are unlimited. You train yourself to wish for the happiness of everybody, no matter who, no matter how good they've been, no matter how bad they've been. You tell yourself you don't want to see anybody suffer. Now, this doesn't mean that they won't suffer, but it just means that you want to make sure your intention around other people is something you can trust. At the same time, you have to be able to develop equanimity when you can see that there are people who are doing things that are unskillful and you can't stop them. So you focus instead on the things that you can have an effect on, the areas where you can make a difference. In some cases, the areas where you can't help people are people, are people who are really close to you. This is where it's hard. Say if someone is ill, you have to remind yourself, okay, you have to accept the fact of their illness, and the next thing is what can you do, what can you do to help them, rather than getting upset about an illness that you can't change, or a character trait that you can't change. Look for the areas where you can to make things better. In this way you start thinking about the well-being of all beings. It takes you out of your narrow concern with your own sense of being pained by something. You think of all the beings in the world. A lot of people out there are suffering right now. So when you're suffering the results of bad karma, you're not the only one. And this takes a lot of the sting away. The Buddha gives the example when he was injured by Devadatta. Devadatta rolled a rock down the mountain hoping to crush the Buddha. The rock was turned off course by another part of the mountain. The rocks shattered and some of the st stone slivers went out, and one of them got into the Buddha's foot, right through the foot. So they had to get the stone sliver out, and then he had to rest. Mara came along to taunt him and said, What are you doing, you sleepyhead? Are you moping around because of what happened? And the Buddha said, No. I'm lying down here with sympathy and goodwill for all beings. That included the people who tried to injure him. That way he wasn't just focused on his own problems. He took a larger perspective. And this larger perspective makes the pains of your past karma much less. The Buddha compares it to a, a river. You've got a lump of salt, you throw it in the river, you can still drink the water. If your mind doesn't have this sense of well being, well-being, this expansive sense of goodwill. It's like a small cup of water. You put that lump of salt in there and you can't drink the water. It's too salty. So try to make your mind like a river. 
and do your best to develop all the qualities that are needed so that you don't have to suffer from past karma. To remind yourself that the possibility of there being past bad karma in there is there for everybody, so you don't get complacent. It's important that you get the right attitude, not so worried about it that you're making yourself miserable. Just learn how to be matter-of-fact about the fact that there's work that needs to be done, and here you've got the opportunity to do it. You can trust in the good effects of the good things you're doing right now. But always have that little voice in the back of the mind that says, if it's not really good yet, you're not going to rest satisfied. The Buddha said that was the secret to his awakening. It was not letting himself rest satisfied or rest content with skillful qualities. If there's a way you can make the mind more skillful, he would do it. It was because of his sense of urgency, his sense of the dangers that are there. Even when you've done a lot of good and at the moment your karmic field is sprouting nothing but good seeds. Remember, you're not totally safe until you've had at least your first taste of awakening. At that point, the Buddha said the, the amount of suffering left for you is like the dirt under his fingernail. Here's another comparison. He picked up some dirt under his fingernail one time and asked the monks, which is greater, the dirt under my fingernail or the dirt in the entire earth? Of course, it's the dirt in the entire earth. The amount of suffering left for someone who's reached the first glimpse of awakening is like the dirt under the fingernail. The possibility of the suffering that's left for you if you don't is like the dirt in the entire earth. So we live in a world of complex interdependencies, which the Buddha never taught as a reassuring thought. It's a scary thought. In complex systems, things can change very quickly. And they can go from one extreme to another very quickly. You hear the planes going over. Okay, there are people up there. They're trying to say that they've got to stay ready for a war. That's their way of being heedful. The Buddha's way of being heedful is that okay, even if there's war, there's no war. There's a danger in being unskillful, and that sense of danger is alive. That sense of heedfulness will help keep you on the path and get you to a point where there is no danger. That's what all these teachings are about. To spur you on to the development of good qualities, and to reassure you that when those good qualities are fully developed, there will be no suffering in the mind. The Buddha says it's like removing an arrow. Once this arrow is removed, then you're free to go where you like. Because where you will like to go at that point will be nothing but skillful. 